She is an actress and writer. She won the Canadian Screen Award for Best Supporting Actress in a Drama Series for her role as Alison Trent in Coroner. She won a special jury award for dramatic performance at the Sundance Film Festival and was an Independent Spirit Award nominee for her performance in the film Four Sheets to the Wind. Please welcome Tamara Pademski. Hi! Wow, that's a good intro, thanks. Yeah, I was always uh, so fascinated, Tamara. We had some early experiences together, I guess, with the res specifically yep but uh you know we spent you know i was an elder i guess at some level i mean older anyway <laughs> than, uh, than the you know the you guys when you all came in together it seemed in 1994 with this film dance me outside so uh, it was kind of a as i remember it was a non-union picture Yep. And all of you at the time, including your sister Jennifer and yep. Michael Gray Eyes and Adam Beach and and Ryan, of course, yep. um, Ryan Black out of Winnipeg. Um, what did that do? You remember those days, of course, and uh, tell us a bit about that film. Well, yes, totally remember those days. That's where it all happened. I think it was very, you know, e even though in your memory, it was, you know, these new youngins coming in, you know, hot on the scene. I remember being very well aware of who set the stage for us. And, you know, Dry Lips Auto Move to Capus Casing was just before that. There was, uh, you know, these powerhouse women in theater that uh, that Bruce McDonald actually got the 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 luxury of taking that whole Toronto group of theater actors and putting us into a Vern Chichu music video. Do you remember that before we shot <laughs> Dance Me Outside? <laughs> and it was all, oh, it was called Lonesome and Hurtin. And, um, and that was really before Dance Me Outside was my, my first real understanding of this is a community. We all know each other. And I was welcomed in with open arms by those older women who had already been doing it for many years at that point. And so maybe different from what some people's first time, you know, when their first movie might have been of like real freaked out and all, but I, I just felt so, um, so protected. I was the youngest one of that, of that group of, of, uh, I think I was 15 at the time. So I just, I have felt like, however crazy this roller coaster has been, I have been, I have been under the wings of, of all of you. And um, it was the best entrance into, <laughs> into the industry that I could have asked for. Yeah. There's several ways I could go with my next question, but I, <laughs> I've got to ask, uh, you, you, know, did, you know, the script you chose or they chose, of course, Bruce. And uh, at the time, I believe it was Norman Jewison had, mm -hmm. And it, it was kind of a project that seemed to have come out of the Canadian Film Center, as I remember. Mm -hmm. But I, as well, as you mentioned, Thompson Highway and Dry Lips had a move to Capus Casey in the, a Governor General award-winning play that we uh, made in 1989, first production, uh, went uh, national in 1990 or so for a couple of years. But um, Thompson had written I didn't know if you knew, but Thompson wrote a screenplay for Dance Me Outside. No, I did not know that and have never heard that. Wow. Wow. And I happened to read it because, I don't know, I was so blown away by the script that Thompson had written for oh that gosh. book, book adaption. And, you know, when, you know, the powers that be chose the other script, which seemed to be more you know and, and I know this is a challenging topic I guess but it seemed a bit more whitewashed like mm -hmm. a lot of Canadian content development was going you know in those days um do you, I was just curious if you knew that and and uh anyway maybe I should move on to another question no it's a it's it's a good I mean first of all I I was I was very aware that we were the only native part of that movie, <laughs> of, <laughs> you know, as the cast, and 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 still, I 
I knew that um, people were, you know, I, I could hear people using their voices to, to share their views and, and um, I was still, I didn't know how to use my voice at that point. And I just, and I only understood the, the implications later of what started, you know, one of several roles that I played where I was a young native woman who died. So now, you know, when we see the trend of, of native women dying on the screen, and I realized that that's how I started in this business and how even the play we did, we did a play at factory. Um, whose play was that? Oh, you, I thought you should have won an Oscar for that. You can't even win Oscars in theater. And what you did on stage there was so brilliant. But I remember the amount I think I committed, I think I was, I was, I was killed in that one too. It was just a workshop. But only in retrospect um, do I realize, do I understand that being thrown into telling those stories on the screen at such a young age, I I, I didn't realize how fiercely we need to protect the representation of those stories. Um, and, and now it's not that I have a clause that I'm not allowed to be murdered on screen anymore, but there was a time there where I, I lost count of how many times I had died as a native woman. And, and I said, um, you know what, I've, I've told that story and now it's time for me to tell other stories. So I think that, that strike, that always, and I remember when I met my, my husband and we were sharing our early work and I was like, so this is, this is a film I want to share with you, Dance Me Outside. And, and he, 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 we were in different countries at the time and he wrote to me and he was like, you could have warned me, like you could have <laughs> at least prepared me for what, and then even I, didn't understand the brutality of it and how it was told in, in that time. Um, I also hadn't seen the film in years. Um, and then I remember another thing very specific at the premiere that we did in Ottawa, where there was a bunch of um, Mohawk women who were so upset by, remember the strong woman song that they play mm -hmm. while the boys are beating the shit out of the car? Right. I mean, there was a lot of conflicting images there, but the and, whole, even the script they chose was right. And, and all that, but it was like, it was, I was so early and maybe that was what, that was the best introduction to understand what it is to, to serve someone else's idea of mm -hmm. a native narrative and what it is to very much what we're all doing right now, which is telling our own stories and representing ourselves the way we know ourselves to be. Yes, I um, was, uh, and maybe I should turn it to Jacques. Uh, no, go ahead, Gary. Well, you know, Tamara, I, I know you've uh, pretty well grown up and you've spent some time, of course, in, uh, in the US as well. And, and there's a similar transition, I guess, that's been going on in Canada, I think you know, in terms of diversity and, uh, and, uh, and representation on television. And, and we're both living now uh, uh, to witness uh, a real big transition mm -hmm. in, in creative control in terms of the diversity of our North American continent. And uh, you're a big part of that as a young actor right from the beginning. Uh, of course, recently winning the Best Supporting Actress in the 2021 Ninth Annual Canadian Screen Award for Best Supporting Actress uh, for the series Coroner, where you play, uh, you know, a, a, a cop, basically, uh, and you, you, you seem to play a lot of cops. Uh, and you had an interesting quote in an interview out of Toronto in how you look at your role as a officer of the law or an investigator and such. Well, the the thing was uh, the thing with coroner. Um, I was I would play the coroner's assistant, but it was at a really you know it was it was happening at a time where um, you couldn't escape you know the media coverage of law enforcement or uh, the legal bodies at large um, where where justice wasn't a part of um, the 
the picture. It was things were, were, were not playing out in, in, a, in an equitable or um, fair way. And, and I, I just, I couldn't, the, the role of Alison Trent was not a native specific role. It was not an ethnic specific role. But as I'm most known as a as a native actress on on television, and I, I brought all of those parts to the role, there it, I, I was quite conflicted with. Um, I'm going to have to answer why there's a native woman working in a coroner's office, which you know in Toronto of all places, and so I had to, for my own character and my own kind of sense of where the world was at and what where the imbalance was um I had to come up with a reason so I just created a whole backstory for myself and I didn't need to tell anybody about it it was just for me um and and it wasn't until he got renewed to season two and they they brought the writers room together again that I said I just before you guys start writing anything I need to tell you where what I'm what I'm what I made up and where I've been you know where Allison comes from and they were so moved by the story that they wrote that into a little bottle episode and so that's why that that um a, a recognition for that episode and that performance is so meaningful to me because they brought in Shannon Masters they brought in an indigenous writer they brought in two young indigenous actors they brought in um they brought the Anishinaabe language we were speaking in scenes on national television in the language and to me I was like uh this is I'm I've, I've done it all now I'm 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 I can I can <laughs> she what we did with her and what we brought to that uh, to that story and and to, and to that show I just um it was one of the greatest accomplishments um in my in my career for sure of just fully representing myself and my community and and my and stories that I know from my world um, to bring that to 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 audiences was um yeah I was very proud of that work now um you know your your childhood is a fascinating story I don't know how much you like to tell of it and all but uh, it, it's a very happy ending in any case uh, maybe you can explain that how you became yeah. such a a great actor. Hmm. Well, um, I was just You're talking primarily about primarily just thinking about your father's <laughs> impact. Uh, yeah. Um, children. We, we yeah we 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 grew up in a in a in a in a broken home and um, an alcoholic home. And I think for for children who know what those environments are are like, or for adults who remember what those environments are like. Um, I think there's this incredible need for stability and for uh, connection. And luckily I had two sisters. Um, I think there's also an incredible need for uh, a way to move that energy, that anxiety, that fear, that um, uncertainty. And um, we found ourselves in, that, you know, make believe and, uh, and performing and putting on little shows and, and imagining other worlds, that was an incredible way to move that energy through us. And so I don't think it's a, a, a coincidence that all three of us became storytellers and professional um, in, uh, storytellers, producers, writers, directors, actors. Um, I think what what the, the real um, luck was that my dad, saw uh, my dad uh, was raising us then and he saw that it was it was something that that helped us it was something that was um was was a positive um effect on us had a positive effect on us and so he did whatever he could he was a single dad and he just found you know whether it was trading services or whether it was uh just um getting <laughs> just how, however creative ways he managed to put us in the classes and and um that became my my salvation wherever it it, it wasn't until like later when you just years and years of telling stories that allow you to tap into the pain that you realize the cost of you're not supposed to tap into it you're not supposed to use it in that way and i only realized that like i think as a young performer it was really useful because it allowed me to be seen it allowed me to 
um, you know, it, it, it boosted my, I mean, my, 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 my value and my purpose that I was here to do something that was really great. And so I think growing up in a home where the arts and performance were encouraged and supported um, really helped me um, get through the, the hardest times. But it wasn't until later on, you know, 20 years of doing it that I realized um, you're not supposed to tickle that stuff all the time or, or scratch at that scab all the time. And I would say in the last 10 years, as life got more intense and, and relationships and marriages and children and, and, and I, I realized there is a, a, there are tools and there are practices and even bringing more, you know, a bit of ceremony or ritual to the work protects those traumas so that you don't have to kick them up to be able to get the performances. And I would say I am very new to that understanding. Thankfully, I, I at least uh, it, 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 it came to me, but I, I, it's, it's still very recent that I'm, that I now know those things, it, it, those things aren't meant to, um, it's, there's clear, clear boundaries between those things. We're talking with uh, Tamara Podemski uh, here today, and uh, it's a pleasure having you with us, Tamara. Um, so good to be here. Yeah. Um, I know you uh, moved to Los Angeles at a certain point in your career, probably, I mean, but the one experience I did want to touch on, maybe you can tell us a bit about, uh, I think you were pretty young when you got the uh, uh, main job for the production of Rent on Broadway, and uh, I, I believe you went to Broadway, didn't you? I did. Tell us what that's like. I mean, you know, as an older performer, that was one thing I always wanted to do was to play Broadway as an actor, and um, you actually did it. Uh, tell us how that experience was. Well, it was uh, it was my dream come true. I. <clears throat> I I was a Broadway like I was obsessed with Broadway's musical theater since I was young. I was part of a choir with Michelle St. John, another Toronto uh, actress. Uh, her dad had a choir that uh, was called the Inner City Gospel Choir, and we toured to New York. And I saw my first Broadway show. I saw a chorus line, and that just ruined me forever. Oh, I, where I just felt that is the greatest. Um, that is the greatest um, culmination of all, all, everything that's buzzing inside of me that I want to do. I want to be on that stage. And so it was just something I tried to, to tried to get into, break into all my life. I don't have a very versatile voice. So there's only, I, I never made it through any of the musical theater auditions in Toronto. Um, but then Rent came around and it was a show that really allowed people who didn't have traditional musical theater voice. It was more rock and roll. We were looking for raw talent which I perfectly fit into. Um, and so if there was any show that, uh, that was gonna bring me there, it, I, it would have been that. And um, I started in the Canadian, original Canadian cast. And I think I made it seven months before they transferred me to Broadway. And it was, um, I don't really know how it happened. I don't even, yeah, I still, I still don't know. I just know that they would move people around all the companies all the time. And, <clears throat> I, I, I do remember, though, that the Canadian company was, the original Canadian cast was so incredible, and the talent and the level of professionalism, and it was such an incredible group of, of performers that by the time I left Broadway, I think we had 10 of the original Canadian cast on, in the Broadway production. Yeah. <laughs> Like just where you just feel so proud, you know, like it's a little, because I think we just, we work so hard. And when you're working in theater in Toronto, you have to hustle so hard. You have to be so good. And, and then you make it to a place like that. And that just all those chops, I think really stand out. And so I was always really proud of every time a new Canadian came, came to the Broadway company. Um, but it was my dream come true. It was very, very hard. Um, I had some really scary moments where my 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 uh, vocal cords almost hemorrhaged and I had to go on vocal rest for two and a half uh, months and was only allowed to write write notes. Um, and uh, it took everything I had. I couldn't do anything but, but live for the show 
from every choice I made from when I woke up in the morning till six o'clock when, when I made my way to the theater. Um, and, and yet I would, I would do it again, but it, it, it has, I think because of it's singing is probably one of the more, the more challenging things for me. I feel like some people wake up and they can just belt out a song. I never had that. I have to work so hard on my voice. So, um, it's gotta be, I would love to go back to Broadway, but I, it's just, I think it is going to be that very particular show. If it was cabaret. I would do cabaret. Cabaret would be my dream. So that's still, I still have Broadway dreams. You have Broadway dreams. We'll go see each other in our Broadway shows in the future. They will happen. We just got to keep on, uh, keep on dreaming. Um, what do you think, Jacques? You want me? Uh, yeah. On, uh, I, well, I, I could uh, ask about a little film called The uh, Lesser Blessed and what kind of experience that was. Or did you want to keep talking about uh, theater? Um, no, I think she's, um, um, I mean, she's been involved in a lot of, uh, what's the writing scene like? And I mean, you know, we're both kind of Toronto developed actors, I suppose you could say, uh, you know, even though we're here in New Mexico and Tamara just finished uh, living here in New Mexico doing a, a brand new series uh, uh, called Outer Range, um, where she plays a, 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 well, a, a cop this time, but opposite the, and with uh, James Brolin. Um, Josh you, Brolin. I'm, oh, Josh Brolin, excuse me. The other Brolin. Uh, how was that experience uh, living in New Mexico? Uh, you've just literally caught me three days after returning. It was it was very intense. It was it was also COVID, like under COVID uh, conditions, which was very isolating, very restricting. I think I would love to have another opportunity to go down there and work um, because uh, it was it was pro it was for sure the hardest gig. I've ever done. Uh, it was seven months, which is the longest I've been away from home. And because the border was closed, no family could come down. We couldn't go back. It was, uh, it was just very, it was very, very challenging. Um, and the only thing that made it worth it was, um, was that the work was very fulfilling and the people were really good. Um, and the, and the few people that we were able to meet, of, you know, of, of, of the local community there um, was, was incredible. I just, I just feel like it would be really great to be able to do it again, because um, working in, in COVID um, is, is really, uh, is a really isolating experience. Did you yeah. get to... Did you get to try any green chili while you were here, working here? I don't think they inject the second you cross the border, they inject that into you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they spray the plane. But I was more of a Christmas gal. Right. Red and green. Red and green. Yeah. Is there anything you can divulge of the. Uh, yeah, I, I can understand that working under. Uh, COVID restrictions, it, it just takes some of the fun away from, uh, but you did live in Albuquerque and, but you shot primarily in Las Vegas, I understand. Yeah. Well, yeah. Was... I think it just, it was, we had a studio in Albuquerque, but the majority of it, it's very, it's, it's an epic uh, story and, and it's mostly that outside, that outdoor, that, that landscape. So most of it was in Las Vegas. Um, so yeah, it was a two hour drive. It pretty much left, left on Sunday nights, came back on Friday. And um, yeah, I think if, if we were to do it again, Albuquerque would not be the most convenient place to set up shop because <laughs> it's, it's long, it's long. And, um, and they're, they're just some of those mountain roads. And we were there in winter. We were there January, February, March. I think the last time I shoveled snow off my car was in, was in May. Yeah, it would make more sense for you to be based in Santa Fe, but it, I guess yeah. it's challenging to stay in Santa Fe uh, with the hotel situation. Yeah. yeah. And then we also shot up an angel fire at 10,500 feet. So that was a nice, that was a nice <laughs> workout. Um, 
but yeah, it was, I felt really, really safe of all the places to be filming. I was, I felt really safe to be in New Mexico. I feel like she took, took good care of her people there. And, uh, and I felt the benefits of that. Yeah. But of course the story is set in Wyoming. So you also, did you end up not shooting in Alberta? Nope, not at all. Not at all. Everything was, everything was New Mexico. Oh, okay. But you were scheduled to shoot several locations originally. I think we were, we were originally supposed to be in the first I heard was a Calgary that it was all going to be in Canada. And then the border issues and COVID made that impossible. Um, And so, yeah, it's all, it's all New Mexico acting as Wyoming. Hmm. Yeah, we put on a good face for Wyoming. Yeah. Um, now that also, which is a, a real tip off here for, I guess, Monday night's uh, evolution of uh, reservation dogs, which uh, you were uh, in the first episode, uh, the <laughs> pilot episode, of course, you've been a favorite of uh, Sterling Harjo for quite some time since Four Sheets in the Wind and your first nomination yeah. as an actor. Um, how, <laughs> and magically, your sister, Sarah, who is a dear friend, and uh, we worked together in Resident Alien. Mm-hmm. But Sarah somehow took your place. Now, are we going to be fooled? Have you seen uh, you playing the same character as your sister? Uh, how's that going to work? No, uh, just... You're letting the radio and uh, world audience know. I don't think anyone else has made <laughs> audiences aware that there's going to be a there's no one will, who will have there's no one out there who will have ever seen me as that i think you just you're the one who just leaked that <laughs> that, that i was in the the pilot but that's how it goes um we tried we tried to make it work and some things just are impossible scheduling um it was heartbreaking thank god sterlin has um has forgiven me <laughs> for this for the scheduling conflict now do you do you know that if he changed the character or are you sarah your sister playing the same character as you she replaced yeah she's 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 rita so we got to see the second episode because i think no they reshot the pilot oh get out wow i didn't know that that's curious information use your connections try to see if you can even get i haven't even seen the one that i did (laughs) I only saw the pilot, so it must have been Sarah. I thought it was you. No, that what? So you got to see the pilot, but you saw the oh. old pilot. That's why. Yeah, they showed it to us because I'm a new actor to the series. Right, and, uh, right. So that's uh, the that I was. I finally it. got then, to see it once I was able to. Uh, uh, you know, it's very hard to see what they send around. It's very yeah, secretive, yeah. and you know something. Oh my gosh! I didn't even get to see that. Yeah, well, you know, I don't have it. You got to talk to Sterling about that. But, <laughs> uh, you know what I can't figure while we're on the air is how do you see it in Canada? But not only that, how do you see it in the U.S.? Reservation Dogs, you go to FX uh, for Sunday night or Monday night schedule. It's not on there. So That's weird. Um, I, I was I had when I was down there last week. I had it on Hulu that it was gonna that it was gonna air. That's how I was gonna see it. And up here, I just signed up to my, I just added it to my cable package. I see Hulu. Yeah. 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 So you can order it. I think it was $4.99. I'm going to do it for the month and then I'm going to cancel it. Oh no, I'm going to have to do it for six. I'm going to have to do it for eight weeks and then I'll cancel it. Um, But no, I'm not missing that. (laughs) We got to tie Jacques in here yeah um you know we've got about uh four minutes roughly left so um you know i know you have a uh, nonprofit or you're an activist uh maybe we could kind of take it in that direction and you could tell us a little bit about that part of your life now that we've heard sure. about your acting and writing or maybe we should talk about writing first uh um we could talk we could we could talk about either um the the the, the the writing the writing came about the right they're kind of connected so 
um, five years ago, um, we uh, we had a, a, a son that uh, Benjamin that died due to medical negligence in the UK. And so we created the Benjamin King Foundation in his honor as a way to um, promote patient safety, um, to empower doctors in, 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 in work of how they can better meet patients when mistakes are made. Um, and so it's through workshops, it's through, um, it's through uh, dialogue, it's just through even uh, bringing uh, more trauma-informed uh, spaces and conversations into the workplace. But um, part of that is that um, when, because we are actors, um, we found it very difficult to return to an industry that asks us to be very emotional and available um, when we had just, we were kind of still in, in the throes of PTSD from, from, from this um, event. And so a lot of a lot of what grew out of that was not being ready to be on screen, but still needing to tell stories. And so both of us kind of threw ourselves into screenwriting, and that was a way um, to to still be engaged and to and still to kind of ignite that part of us that needed to be um, be awake and 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 serve some some story out there. Um, and so for me, it was, it was my sister, Jen, who had a, a show called Future History. She was a part of the Writers Guild, so she couldn't afford to hire herself. So she hired me. So I was the cheaper <laughs> labor to be able to write her show. And, and it was about, it was a documentary series. It was really about people in our community who were doing incredible work, indigenizing um, different different um, parts of, I guess, the the world right now, whether it's education or science or um, uh, cultural revitalizations, um, language, um, uh, yeah, sports, oh my gosh, even like we, we would just research as many people out there restricted to Ontario for the first season, and, and then take our two hosts on this journey through Indian country where they are harnessing the knowledge of the past to indigenize the future. And for me, it was the most healing work. It is what kind of pulled me out of the darkness of this kind of year that we just, we just hibernated ourselves to take care of, of our, our own well-being and mental health. And the writing came out of that. And the writing was just, the writing still kind of offers me that other place where I don't have to be as engaged as I am as a performer, but I can do it from here. I can do it in the safety of my, my own creative space. Um, and I think there's also, especially when you're recovering from, from trauma, there's, there's, you, there's just, you're so like feeling so out of control. Like you just have no um, agency to do anything. Um, and, and writing is this really amazing way to just control it all. And even though, yes, there's still a network who tells me I can't do that, but in the moment of it, I'm, I'm, I'm the master of my universe for a few moments. So the, the writing is, is, um, I hope to continue. We, we didn't get renewed. We did two seasons of future history, um, which you can see in Canada on CBC gem. Um, but now I just have a script. Now I have a script that I'm working on and it's my thing that kind of, whenever this world out here seems too crazy, I, I come back and become the, the, the master of my universe, my little universe again. Well, make sure you write me in. Of course. Some old guy. <laughs> You're doing pretty good for an old guy. Jeez. Yeah, I've never been so happy that yeah. way. <laughs> well, many ways, but uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. You know, you, you fight life to work and tell stories and yeah. uh, as you get older in the twilight you're going to turn the bulb out soon and all of a sudden you're hot I'm hottest hot. guy on the scene again yeah. <laughs> yeah. anyway it's fun i enjoy it still although i just had a bad experience uh, you know it was one of the strangest situations it would be hilarious to recreate it and 
would happen to me, especially with the outfit I had on and such. But uh, that's another story. Off the air story? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Off the air story. Okay. <laughs> He's waiting for his job. Sorry, uh, that's a show, you guys. Uh, but uh, Gary, if there's anything else you want to say uh, before we go, or you want to ask her anything else, we'll, I'm sure we'll find room for. Um, no, I, I, I think we got into it a bit. I, I uh, you know, t we did a series like uh, she said. Uh, uh, tomorrow we, you know, we had some early success, like you said. Uh, I actually was in competition with uh, North of 60, which ran for, I don't know, nine or 10 years in Canada. That must have been probably, I don't know, early 90s, probably. Yeah. Um, and so there there was mainstream television in Canada with native yep. uh, protagonists and, and everything and total show, you know, very few non-native people in the show. Yep. Uh, and of course, Native people have been in Canadian television since, you know, Beachcombers. Beachcombers. I remember Augie Schellenberg's uh, uh, version of uh, uh, which major chief, I can't think, from uh, Wounded Knee. Uh, anyway, Augie's performance of that, uh, you know, he was, uh, uh, again, half Jewish, half Mohawk uh, performer back in our day. Uh, very strong uh, mm -hmm. character actor and uh, so there's been a longer history do you think of the arts with native people involved in Canada than the U.S. Uh, you've worked in both countries. Yeah I feel like down there they always think that we're decades ahead of them in terms of our representation on the screen and so from from what it seems I think I think our because we make up the same percentage of the population down there and and yet it seems that we're more visible up here and um, whether there are just better platforms through government agencies or through these these um, indigenous organizations that but I know that they, they have them down there too so I don't know what makes the difference but we are for sure more visible up here and we're also louder up here so we we seem to be seen and heard more because down there they just they they feel like like it's they're aspiring to, to to be us up in Canada so I have to kind of always give them a reality check of 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 the things that the challenges that we're still we're still facing but I I also I also think we're all we're 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 much tighter as a community like across from Halifax to Vancouver we are this very tight-knit community of Indigenous actors writers producers choreographers it's been like that since, like, from what I understood, like since the seventies, that you guys were just a tribe of artists and you were real tight, and and that kind of unity or that kind of that I, I I'm only starting to feel now in the states that they all know each other, work together, hold on to each other, you know, raise each other up. That's like the last ten years I feel where I think of, you know, R Renee Highway days and those early days in the 70s that you guys were all just doing it. You were all, you were doing it back then. Yeah, it was all upstart. It really was. Yeah, it wasn't there. So you created it. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, I look back and, and think that, oh, you know, who do you, who do you credit? I mean, Thompson was right there, but James Rainey, you know, like an early playwright, the Canadian playwright, knew the stories he wanted to tell in terms of historical melodrama he, he kind of needed us he needed performers mm. that were natives to, to because they were active members of the creation of that canadian yeah. society but uh yeah it's a very interesting dynamic of course much smaller population up there uh, yeah. much more different politics but kind of the same on many levels but uh yeah, it's interesting, the challenges. 
very interesting perspective, Tamara, and thank you so much for being Tamara Pademski uh, is our guest today, and thank you so much. Meow it, Jimmy Gretch. It was so good to chat with you all.